Chicago's vaccine mandate is causing a commotion with unions and one indicted older person loosens her grasp on power. All that and more with our Spotlight Politics team. Welcome back, Amanda Venicky, Heather Sharon, and Paris Schutz. We've got the whole team. So Mayor Lightfoot made good on her promise earlier this week on mandating vaccinations for city workers. Take a look. We absolutely have to have a vaccine mandate. It's for the safety um, of all involved, particularly members of the public who are interacting with city employees on a daily basis. It's important for um, colleagues uh, to also feel like they have a workplace that is safe. And in response, according to the Chicago Sun-Times, FOP President John Catanzara Jr. said in part, get ready for this, quote, this has literally lit a bomb underneath the membership. We're in America, goddammit. We don't want to be forced to do anything, period. This ain't Nazi effing Germany. That's a quote from uh, the Chicago Sun-Times. If today. he hadn't so, pulled out of our show last night, maybe he would have said that on, He could have, he could have said that right here yeah. on Chicago Tonight. So, Heather, let's start with you. Clearly, tensions are high around this vaccine mandate. The mayor announced it today via a press release, um, but aren't negotiations with some various unions still ongoing? They are, and typically Mayor Lightfoot has been very close to unions, not the police union, but the Chicago Federation of Labor has frequently stood with her at COVID-19 related events and praised her leadership. They didn't do that today. They pushed back on this vaccine mandate, which at with, comes without a bargained agreement between the city and its union represented employees, which is what is causing a lot of this controversy. It, it clearly shows that Mayor Lightfoot felt the need to act quickly. COVID cases have at least flattened a little bit in the last couple of days, but hospitalizations are still sort of very high. And there's no doubt that she felt that this was the time to act. T Cook County Board President Tony Preckwinkle announced a vac vaccine mandate for her office's employees on Friday. And this is clearly a trend that we're seeing in big cities like New York and San Francisco and St. Louis. And Amanda, the Chicago Federation of Labor, though, they say that mandates could backfire. What do they mean by that? I think that they mean that people are just going to be super frustrated that they see this as a punitive measure and that we might see, I think, legal action on the state level as well as on the city level when it comes to these mandates because bargaining is required. And so the notion would be that opposition to the vaccine might harden they are saying versus members saying oh gosh we want to uh, we want to save our jobs and so we're going to get the shot that instead they are going to count on the protection of their union and trust that this is not going to go through in the end and will hold off on actually doing what the mayor wants and that is to of course be vaccinated get we have workers be vaccinated right if i could just jump in for a minute the the it, this is a rare instance when you have the chicago teachers union and mayor lightfoot on the same page. The Chicago Teachers Union is the only city union that is not opposed to a vaccine mandate, which was announced way back on August 13th. So I think that shows you sort of the politics of this issue aren't isn't falling along the usual lines, although of course the FOP is the FOP. Speaking of the FOP, and that's a very good point, everything you just said there, of course, Heather, FOP, the Chicago's rank and file police union, uh, vows to fight the mandates 100%. In the other police unions, we've, we're hearing that they are against it as well. Paris, what have you heard from the FOP? Well, what they've said is they met with the city along with the unions that represent police captains and police sergeants, and they say that all of these groups are, are unified in saying that they oppose vaccine mandates but they don't have any specifics from the city on this yet you know all they know is what the mayor has come out and said they say they expect some kind of specific proposal in the coming days and then they'll react whether that means taking the city to court or i could envision a scenario where over the next couple of weeks they hammer some kind of agreement out where there are some kind of exceptions i mean given the words from mr catanzara today it doesn't seem likely that that they're in a negotiating or compromising mood but but again, what they say is they don't have the specifics of it, uh, but you just see all the hyperbole there out in the media. Yeah, lots of some strong words already. Um, so Governor Pritzker, he has sounded the warning bells about a possible return of restrictions if hospital beds continue to fill. If the hospital beds and ICUs get full like they are in Kentucky, that's just next door to Illinois. If that happens, we're going to have to impose significantly greater mitigations. 
So, Amanda, you know, the governor's dire warnings are ringing out, but we're still hearing that AFSME is also pushing back against the state vaccine mandates. What's going on? So we've got two things here, first of which would be any sort of mitigations that would apply to anybody and everybody. The governor talks about having a menu of options on the table, but he's also frequently said that this is different than when we saw restrictions that required businesses to either close or to really have narrow events because now a vaccine is available. And so we don't yet know what that could look like. Might it be um, testing measures or uh, vaccine requirements or what? We, we, we don't quite know what sort of measures he is looking at there. So you have that on one hand. And then secondly, the state right now does have a vaccine mandate that requires workers who are in congregate settings. So things like, you know, um, prisons and veterans home employees there need to have the vaccine by October 4th. This even as the state's largest public employees union is bargaining with the state and so asked me also out with a note to membership saying that we are going to oppose this sort of rigid mandate they want things like um, if somebody gets COVID to they they get paid time off and they say that they're encouraging members to get the vaccine but they do not want the state to require it so this is similar to with the city number one I could foresee legal action coming and number two this is a case for very strange bedfellows because typically the governor is in tandem with unions, particularly with AFSCME, but AFSCME, by the way, representing a lot of employees, for example, those working at state prisons, and that is a different political audience than one that Pritzker is typically close with and aligned to. Okay, so let's get into city politics a little bit. Uh, indicted uh, alder person Carrie Austin stepping down as chair of a city council committee. Uh, Paris, remind us, you know, who she is, her tenure at the city council, and, and what she's been indicted for. Well, she's been there a long time, 34th Ward uh, alder woman. She took over for her late husband, Lemuel Austin. She was the former chair of city council's budget committee, allied with Mayors Emanuel, Daly, Lightfoot usually goes along and gets along with the mayor. Uh, she's charged with getting some really nice home improvements, new kitchen cabinets, granite countertops, some pumps for her house from a developer, uh, developing something in her ward whom she helped steer some taxpayer money to. She has pleaded not guilty to these charges, and it's interesting that uh, you know, the mayor worked out this compromise with Carrie Austin. Again, she was chair of the budget committee, which is a plum job. Lightfoot knew when she came in that Austin was under some federal scrutiny. So instead of get her out of committees altogether, aldermen love having, they love to be the chair of a committee. It means more jobs. It means more responsibility. And, and anyway, so she made this other committee uh, that uh, Carrie Austin was the chairperson of. Carrie Austin then and, uh, stepped down uh, yesterday. Yeah, and Heather, let's get into that a little bit. Uh, was this expected that she would step down from this particular uh, committee chairmanship after she was charged? Did the mayor have to push her? Well, it's a little bit unclear to me because the mayor said on Monday that she was talking to Alderman Austin, but she stopped far short of demanding Austin's resignation. And we know what it sounds like when Mayor Lightfoot tells somebody re to resign because she's done it repeatedly with Alderman Ed Burke, who of course is also under federal indictment. And she didn't do that with Alderman Austin, who has been a reliable vote for her budget and other crucial programs. And the mayor has a very narrow council majority to work with so it was a lot of delicate backroom negotiations I, I don't think Austin relished resigning uh, as Paris said she's been a power player at City Hall for for decades really and this is sort of a, a, a sign that perhaps she is losing her grip on power but her record with this with this contracting oversight and equity committee uh, raised some question the committee spent more than hundred and ninety one thousand thousand dollars and met three times in 2020 it met yesterday for the first time since july of 2020 and a very crucial effort to extend a program that ensures that businesses owned by black latino asian and women in chicago get their fair share of chicago contracts had been stalled because of that lack of meeting so there was clearly sort of coming to a boiling point um, on all of these issues of course there's a lot of intrigue around who's in and who's out in the redrawing of the state's political maps uh, state lawmakers have been told by a judge to correct the political maps using the latest census data so uh, amanda both the house and senate head back down to springfield on tuesday to work on these maps one Republican uh, member, Rodney da Congressman Rodney Davis, has an official Democratic opponent, but could a map after Tuesday leave him out? 
So he might be left out or at least in a difficult position to try to retain his seat and whatever his new district looks like. But, oh, wait, he still is going to have to wait, as does his opponent, and that is a former advisor to Governor Pritzker, Nikki Badinsky. But that map is not going to be redone Tuesday. People looking to go to D.C. to represent Illinois in Congress, well, they've got to wait. The state has not, the Democrats who control the General Assembly aren't even touching that yet. Instead, they are, appear to be sort of taking very closely this warning from a federal judge who says, hey, wait, you erred in the initial draw of the map that relied on survey data versus actual census results, so go back at it. It is unclear whether whatever happens Tuesday, and this again will be a map drawn by Democrats, they're holding hearings starting tomorrow actually, where they want public uh, members of the public to weigh in, which is really sort of a silly exercise. Members of the public have long made their demands. Democrats drew the maps regardless. We don't know what the new districts will look like, and yet this is supposed to be something the public can weigh in on. So it's really and, sort of farcical there. Yeah, and another Republican congressman, the outspoken Adam Kinzinger, also may be in trouble on the new map, Paris. Could he be left out? Well, I think he's even saying he thinks he's going to be left out. Mathematically, you know, as Amanda said, Democrats want to draw maps that favor them, that give them more chances at more congressional seats in Illinois. And, you know, he represents some of the south suburbs, and then it cuts all the way up to the Wisconsin border. And it seems like if Democrats want a favorable district, they might have to cut him out. And that's basically what he's saying. And he's saying, like, he's a piece. You know, he doesn't know what he wants to do next. He's going to continue his crusade to try and fix what he sees is wrong with his own party, the GOP, and their drift toward Trump. There's talk he might run for Senate. That would be difficult because he's not very pop popular among Republicans, so it would be tough for him in a primary uh, and also if he runs for governor. So I think, I think it's wide open. Okay, and, and we've got about 20 seconds left, but uh, Heather, we know that the Inspector General of the city uh, releasing a report criticizing uh, the city's use of the shot spotter technology. That's not the only one that's taken some criticism, though. No, it's the latest in a string of really uh, pointed uh, audits performed by Inspector General Joseph Ferguson, who will leave office in October. He found that the shot spotter program isn't worth what the city is paying for it. It rarely detects gunshots that rarely help people fight crime. Very similar to what he said about the police department's gang database, which is, of course, still up and running. Um, and he says is is not worth even having because it's filled with uh, erroneous data that disproportionately targets black and Latino Chicagoans. Okay, more to come as always. Thanks to our Spotlight Politics team, Amanda Vinicky, Heather Sharon, and of course, Paris Schatz.